Well, thank you very much for that. I, I should probably begin by clarifying, as you can imagine, after the national security law, um, that particular introduction is, is not necessarily too accurate. So, so I have resigned from all directorships in Hong Kong. And I, I, I speak very much purely as a, as a private individual, as, as indeed I think I, I have been doing in, in the past few years. Uh, and, and it's also worth, uh, worth pointing out that um, I, I uh, am now based in the UK. So, so I, I left Hong Kong, which is um, the, the city I was born to, um, the city where, where several generations of my family had called home. And uh, I'm very proud to consider myself a Hong Kong Yun uh, as well. So, you know, to me, I, I look at Hong Kong not as a journalist, but, but very much as, um, a, a, as a citizen and, and, and as someone who, who really loves that city and loves its people and, and everything I, I think it, it, um, it, you know, it stands for. So um, my my talk, I'll, I'll try and I'll try and keep it as, as sort of brief as possible. I, I'm aware that um, it's it's a topic where you know should should time permit, you could go down many different avenues and, and explore in more detail. But but I would like to to, to basically um, sp split my talk into sort of three separate parts. So, so the first part would be, you know, really looking at the long view here and, and um, you know, understanding press freedom, you know, its, its role in Hong Kong. Uh, and um, I, I think sort of understanding where perhaps some of the seed, the, the seed challenge, well, well, some of the challenges were first seeded in, in relation to, to uh, um, threats to, to press freedom. Uh, the, the second part is really sort of looking at Hong Kong what I would describe as, as you know, sort of the, the slow, sort of steady build-up of, of first challenges and then and then actual erosion of press freedom in Hong Kong, and, and that I, I like to, to to look at it really sort of from 2003 onwards, right up to to 2014, um, and uh, um, with with a real jump from 2012. So so you know, as as I think we're seeing as a as a, a regular theme here amongst many speakers, that there was certainly a, a change when Mr. Xi Jinping um, came along. And, and then the, the third part would be really sort of looking at, at two, you know, post-2014 and, and really sort of focusing on, on what's happened last year, um, you know, during the, post -ex the, the extradition bill uh, protests and um, coming up to, to the national security legislation, which of course has, has uh, recently been been enacted uh, and I guess behind all of this is is really sort of the um, a key message which I'd like to get across and that is you know the the challenges to press freedom in Hong Kong it's not something new it's not something that has come out you know certainly because of Covid or has come out in the last year it the, the, it's it's something which has been been a concern now for for many years um, and um, I, I also want to sort of stress that, you know, with, with how things have, have, have played out, again, certainly in the last year, you know, I think there is an international dimension that we, we, we have to recognise and, um, uh, you know, it does present an, an international challenge as well as a Hong Kong challenge. So, um, I guess the, the, the first section, which is probably the the, the shorter section. <laughs> yeah, I mean, press freedom really is quite core to Hong Kong. And, you know, I think it, it's something which is, ha, has uh, distinguished Hong Kong from, from mainland China, you know, even when you go back to colonial days. I, I mean, there's, there's a, a wonderful sort of description of Hong Kong as in some ways being a, a, um, a mistress that, that, that has been um, sort of freed <laughs> so so it, it's it, it is it, it's a mistress that has been freed from china for su for such a long time in in one way in in a patriotic perhaps or in, in a in a, a a a nationalistic way you know it's a source of great pain but but at the same time um you know it, it has the the separation of, of hong kong from beijing 
I, I think did allow Hong Kong to very much um, take its own line, you know, take its own course. And uh, I think it's also important to stress that press freedom played a very important part in the development of Hong Kong, because of course, you know, during the colonial era, you know, Hong Kong has, has never had a, a representative political system. Uh, you know, there, there were reforms that were put in, I, I think, um, you know, most advanced by, by the last governor, Chris Patton, in, in 93 and 94. But, um, you know, there's always been a, a political representative deficit. Um, so, so the press played a very important role in providing the people of Hong Kong an avenue to, to, to connect with, their, with, with the government, you know, to connect with those who had power. It, it was an important way of, of um, allowing people to have some form of expression. And that is especially important when the political system doesn't offer that. I also think, you know, press freedom was, was instrumental in, in sort of under, um, underpinning the type of society that, that evolved in Hong Kong, you know, that was um, both immigrant, but, but it was also very multicultural. And when I use the word multicultural, it, it, it's not just to sort of say you had people from many parts of the world that came to Hong Kong, but critically you had people who came from many parts of China. I, one story I, I love to tell is that uh, I, you know, when I was um, still in Hong Kong, I, I used to get invited to, to schools there to, to um, you know, to talk about sort of identity and cultural issues. And I used to ask a question. I used to go to the international schools and I used to say, in what way is Hong Kong very diverse and multicultural? And they would say, oh, well, we've got, we've got students here from all over the world, from Australia, from Canada, you know, from the UK. Or, um, and, and when I would go to, to local schools and I'd ask the same question, uh, you know, in Cantonese, they would turn around and they would say, well, of course, Hong Kong is so multicultural and diverse. We have people from all parts of China. You know, and, and who, who, have, uh, who, who relate to China in many different ways and, and who identify as being Chinese in many different ways. It's certainly not sort of, you know, this monolithic culture at all. And, and I think in many ways, you, you know, Hong Kong was able to kind of preserve that diversity that once existed in China. And, and that in, in, you know, coming back to sort of freedom of expression and freedom of the press, you know, that was sort of underpinned by a respect and an understanding for those core values. And of course, after the handover, you know, I think the, the recognition um, that, that, you know, um, freedom of press and publication and, and, and association, which interestingly was all put together under sort of freedom of speech and expression, uh, you know, it, it was codified in, in Hong Kong's basic basic law, Hong Kong's mini constitution. So, you know, legally there are protections there. I mean, article 27 of the basic law, um, got it here. My, my memory isn't quite as good as, as it perhaps once was, but, but, you know, to quote it, it says, Hong Kong residents shall have the freedom of speech, of the press and of publication, freedom of association, of assembly, of procession and of demonstration. Interestingly enough, um, article 27, as you can imagine, is, is looked at quite often these days in relation to to some of the developments now. But, but the, the importance of, of that was, you know, at least the perceived importance continued even in the national security law that just passed. I mean, Article 4, um, you know, right at the very beginning that does state that, you know, it reconfirms supposedly that guarantee. Um, and I also think it's important to understand in, in Hong Kong that, you know, it's not about just making a judgment on, on how the situation is like in Hong Kong at the moment. We have to understand that Hong Kong really was an example for Asia. You know, so, so I think you often hear people who sort of say, well, you know, look at the situation in Singapore, look at the situation in other parts of Asia. Um, it, it really doesn't flow, it really doesn't carry because, you know, Hong Kong, Hong Kong was unique and it was different because it wasn't Singapore. And, uh, you know, consequentially, I, I mean, I think, you know, there's, there's been um, a significant international concern. I mean, when you, when you look at uh, Reporters Without Borders, I mean, their press freedom index, you know, Hong Kong dropped from, in 2002, it dropped from 18th in the world to 80th in, in the world, um, um, you, you know, in their last report. Uh, and, um, you know, from in, in 2009, you know, for the first time, Freedom House, 
uh, they, they sort of classified or they rated Hong Kong's press freedom as, as, as being only partially free. Uh, again, you know, one could easily look at other places in Asia and sort of say it's not too bad, but, but we are looking at something that was supposedly the paragon. You, you know, it set the standard in Asia and, and to see it undermined in this way, you, you know, I think we, we have to appreciate it. It, it has, it has uh, impacts on the way we frame and understand press freedom in, in Asia. So if, if I could just sort of quickly sort of move on, you know, in, in short, in, in 2003, you had, um, you know, the, the article, article 23 protests where, where half a million people came out onto the street and, you know, the security legislation uh, was, was withdrawn. Uh, you, from 2003, you, you did see um, Beijing, you know, let's say, um, take a closer interest in, in what was happening in Hong Kong. I mean, I, mean, I think, you know, they, they really sort of saw that as, as a setback. Up until between 97 and 2003, there were some concerns regarding sort of judicial independence, but I think in relation to, to press freedoms and, you know, for most people in Hong Kong, they, they didn't feel there was such an intrusion. Um, the, the real turning point really sort of happened in 2012. Um, the, you know, at the time you had national education, um, you know, the national and patriotic education, essentially of China being, being um, imposed in form in, into Hong Kong. And this was something which was quite openly pushed, not by the Hong Kong government, but, but by Beijing. And of course, when, um, when popular protests basically meant that that was withdrawn and, and it, didn't, you know, it didn't, didn't carry through, you know, there, there were many in Beijing who saw that really as a sort of a, a personal blow. And, you know, that was a message which was communicated to, to many people uh, in, in Hong Kong as well. And, and I think, um, you know, you saw an immediate reaction to that, the, the liaison office in Hong Kong, which of course, um, you know, legally is not supposed to, to interfere at all in, in, in the running of Hong Kong. There was a major reshuffle and, and you saw, I think, a, a, uh, an increasingly sort of hard line and, and, and increasing intrusion you know, from the liaison office. From 2012 onwards, you, you know, you would have uh, the director of the liaison office phoning up um, proprietors of, of, of papers, phoning up editors, you know, and, and essentially making demands. Um, and really from, from 2012, you know, this, this erosion, I, I mean, I think there was, you know, the, the overall tactics, typical sort of carrot and stick, you know, the, the, the stick was political pressure. Um, I, I mean, I mentioned, you know, phoning up owners. I mean, even Henry Lee, you know, who, who, who um, was the, the owner of the Hong Kong Economic Journal, and of course, you know, a, a, um, a ski on of an extremely important and powerful Hong Kong family, you know, it, it didn't prevent the, the head of the liaison office actually phoning him up and again, sort of making demands in, in relation to what should be carried, what shouldn't be carried, what you should avoid, what you should not report on. Um, at the same time, there was, you know, the, the carrot was, was to um, dangle appointments to the CPPCC and, and, and to the NPC, which of course is very important for, you know, for, for the, the business tycoons and, and other sort of commercial interests who were buying into the media. Um, you know, let's be, let's be frank about it. I mean, I don't think anyone um, chooses to, to own, a, a, you know, own a newspaper in order to make money. I, I mean, you know, you own a newspaper in order to, to see what favours could be carried in Beijing, you know, so, and, and Beijing, Beijing was very happy to sort of, you know, oblige with that. But then, of course, and, and, and this is something which I, I've considered to be very much beyond the pale, you, you know, there, there was a third element to that tactic. And, they, you know, this was, this was physical intimidation, you know, this was um, the, the use of threats and, and dismissals. This was um, in, in the, the, you know, the case of Chen Ping and, and um, Kevin Lau in, in, in early 2014. You, you know, on the streets of Hong Kong, someone going to breakfast could be attacked in broad daylight in front of everyone with, with a chopper. And the police are unable to, to, to catch the culprit. Uh, you know, I, I mean, I think I think it, it is fair to say that that it, you know it's it's highly likely that that type of action and um, the the people who sort of carried that out w weren't necessarily sort of based in Hong Kong. It was probably facilitated, you know, through 
through the the um, um, I suppose more criminal elements of the um, um, United Front work, but but you know it, it was it was very very concerning. So I think I think a lot of these concerns uh, about press freedom in, in Hong Kong, you know, they they were there in two thousand and fourteen, and you know, coming speaking personally as someone who was involved in in you know the establishing of of online independent um, uh, papers in Hong Kong, um, we didn't do that because. Hong Kong is a wonderfully free place, and this is part of you know the vibrant you know the the, the vibrancy of, of Hong Kong's press scene. Um, these were set up because there was already very very serious concerns about press freedom in Hong Kong. You know, it, it was it wasn't it wasn't symbolic. It was actually a reaction. It, it was an attempt, I think, by the community to to you know make a stand. Um, now, of course, in 2014, I, I mean, I do like to sort of tell some people who sort of say, well, you know, the situation's very bad now. Uh, ju just, think, just think where Hong Kong was in, in 2014, when um, you could have, you know, in the beginning of 2014, there, there had been 12 physical attacks that had been committed to, uh, on journalists in, in Hong Kong. Um, two of those attacks dated back to, to colonial times. But it was interesting that 10 of the 12, so the other 10 attacks uh, all occurred within two years of, of 2014, between 2012 and 2014. Um, of course, they were commercial threats that, that were already taking place. Ads were being withdrawn uh, from, from uh, leading newspapers. All of these were newspapers that, that were the, the remnants of um, the the papers in Hong Kong that could, that were still relatively independent to be to be critical of, of Beijing, um, licensing uh, was was being used. So so you know official means. I, I mean we know now that of course the foreign journalists are, are having problems with with uh, um, uh, having visas renewed. So so the visas in Hong Kong are being used as as uh, as a means to apply pressure. But even back in 2014, you you, you had licensing issues where um, you know li the licensing was was swung to to basically silence certain commentators and columnists um, so so um, probably the most famous was was Li Wai, Li Wai Ling at, at commercial radio you know who, who was essentially pushed from a very very popular very popular show uh, again you know by by threatening action over licensing and, and in 2014 um, I also found it interesting that you know both the the former Secretary of Justice, you know, and the former Chief Justice Andrew Lee, you know, felt back then um, that what was happening in, in Hong Kong was such a concern that both of them would make public statements in in relation to to the need you know for, for the general public to be particularly vigilant about developments in Hong Kong, and you know to to protect press freedoms. So. Um, I think really what I'm sort of trying to get here is that, you know, I, I could go on. I, I mean, at the time, you know, there was, there was um, Shirley Yam at the Hong Kong Journalists Association had done an investigation, you know, looking at self-censorship. Um, one, one, one little story she says, which I think, you know, sums it up really quite well is, you know, she, she referred to, back, again, this is back in 2014, how, um, press freedom, the, the idea of press freedom was, was increasingly being politicized. It was becoming a taboo. You know, when she, when she mentioned to, to, when she was being interviewed, you know, by, by a, um, a, a local um, journalist, you know, she said, she said, well, you know, we, we do a lot to promote education about press freedom. Uh, you know, that was framed as brainwashing. <laughs> you know, that was framed as something which was, which was bad. So, so, you know, rather than seeing it, it as core to Hong Kong and, and something that legally um, should be protected, it was increasingly no, not a legal issue, but it was increasingly a political issue and being viewed politically. Um, and, uh, you know, if, 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 if I'm aware of time here, um, you know, if, if I look sort of now, you know, in, in the last sort of year, and, and this is, I think, what, what worries me at the moment. I, I see a further escalation. You know, it's not just about, you know, trying to, trying to, to um, 
uh, put pressure on, on, on the press in, in Hong Kong. Uh, you know, I think after the protest last year, you know, there's been a, a very clear sort of campaign of disinformation to, to actually undermine trust in Hong Kong um, in the press itself. So, so the press has, you know, has rather than being sort of muzzled, the press now is, 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 the, um, is the target. You know, it, it's, uh, and, and I, you know, if I was to sort of go through this, you, know, you, you have, I suppose, overtly, you've got the police actions, you know, against the press. Um, so you have, uh, you know, reported without borders. I think they, they refer to it as sort of a, a, a very consistent and constant trend of harassment and physical threat against journalists in, in Hong Kong, you know, with the use of kettling by, by the police. And, and uh, interestingly enough, you know, doxing, where, where the information is believed to have been released from, from police sources. And, you know, even, even the former chief executive, C.Y. Learn, can, can actually publicly run a, a campaign to encourage people to, to, to dox not only protesters, but also journalists, uh, knowing full well that journalists are being attacked in, in public. Um, interesting enough, the police have, have also come out and, you know, declared journalists as as being fake, um, as as a reason to exclude journalists from from certain um, uh, you know sort of um, uh, presses and and uh, you know whilst the, the the police have constantly run this line, you know and uh, have also made claims of journalists having attacked policemen and and, and of the use of counterfeit uh, you know sort of press credentials. It's it's interesting to see that due to a lack of evidence. And as we know in the protest, there's an awful lot of information that's being collected, you know, by the police and also by other journalists as to what's happening. Uh, you know, the police ha have, have not filed a single case. You know, so there, there are these allegations being made, but there just simply isn't the, the you know, the, the evidence to, to, to be able to take these allegations further. Yet the police are consistently pushing, you know, this, this allegation that in some ways Hong Kong journalists and, and now even you know, in, 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 with, with the arrest of Jimmy Lai, of course, they even, they even sort of said RTHK journalists and AFP and Reuters journalists, um, you know, are, are unfriendly. They're, up, they're, they're biased and, you know, implying that they're in some way sort of unprofessional. Uh, and, and then, of course, you, you know, you've also got the covert um, um, criticism of journalism. You know, we have seen a disinformation campaign, um, you know, that, that has been run out of unfortunately, a, a certain state. And, um, you know, the, the, the campaign has not only been sort of smearing the protests themselves, but it's also been targeting, um, you know, the journalists and, and the way the protests are being reported. And, and you know, we've, Twitter last August, uh, you know, had already re removed almost a thousand accounts, which which was only a fraction of what they believed, you, you know, were, were actually operating. I mean, the estimates are, uh, go up to about 200,000. A month later, they then had to remove, you know, another 10,000 accounts. You know, you've got zombie accounts that, that are being be, being um, set up on social media. So, so either, either sort of hacked accounts or accounts that are, are specifically set up by the state. Uh, yeah, so, so sorry, in, in September, you know, they, uh, Twitter actually removed 500, uh, sorry, 5,000 accounts, which they believe were directly state controlled, and 200,000 related accounts, um, many of those, you know, potentially being zombie accounts. Um, and the, the, you know, there's, there's, there, there's the, how to put it, the, the, disin, the disinformation, um, unfortunately, you know, it, it is working. I mean, you see Hong Kong now and, and you know, you see the results of the protests. Um, Hong Kong has become very divided. You know, I think the positions have become, you know, greatly entrenched. I mean, one of the great ironies is, you know, the, the whole point of journalism is, is really to, to seek out what the truth is. We, we perfectly accept that um, there are different perspectives on, on the truth. But, but you need to sort of seek that truth and you need to have that truth in the middle to be able to come to some sort of compromise, you know, to have any form of, of meaningful engagement. And I think what, what, what you've certainly seen in Hong Kong uh, in the last year is a move away from an attempt to control the press to, to, to now to 
demonize it. Um, you know, and uh, also for the first time, you know, I, I know, I know Victor Mallet, you know, his visa was, was denied a few years back, you know, but, but I do believe that was more to do with, um, you know, his, his role in, in hosting, hosting a talk at the FCC, as opposed to his, his work at the Financial Times. But now you're seeing um, the very best in international journalism specifically targeted um, as you know, China really sort of pushes its own its own alternative reality. Uh, if you, what I found quite interesting being in the UK, it has been not only to look at what's been done in Hong Kong and and you know being done by by researchers as sort of globally looking at at China, but also sort of tying that up into into work that's been done on on Russian disinformation and also in relation to COVID. You know, there, there was. There was sort of compelling evidence that the Chinese were paying, you know, I believe it was 20 euros for, for students, you know, in, in Europe to, to come out and, and to, to, to write things in, in support of their particular position. And I, I, I do feel in, in, in regards to what's happened with COVID, you know, a lot of the networks that, that uh, in both in breadth and also in depth within different societies, um, they're not new. It's not as though they've just they've just sprung up post COVID as a way to, to influence, um, you know, global opinion. They've been there for, for some time. Um, they've been there, you know, we know with many of these accounts, they've been dormant for, for two or more years. Um, originally, I think, you know, there was a feeling that, that China's interest was really defensive in the sense of it, it meant it wanted to use its influence to kind of push, um, a positive image of China, but you know, but that's changed now, and and um, you know, I think Hong Kong has been in some ways a testbed um, for that.